Hey guys, Andre from High Performance Academy. Welcome along to this week's webinar. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about fuel pumps, specifically mechanical versus electric fuel pumps. I'm even going to throw in a little bit of information there about brushed style versus brushless pumps. Basically everything that you're going to need to know if you are looking at choosing a fuel pump for your project. Before we get into that though, an update on a few things that have been going on around here over the last week since our last webinar. Some things unfortunately didn't quite go to plan. Let's just jump straight in by heading over to my laptop screen, watch a really short little video here and then I'll explain where things all went horribly pear-shaped. Let's get stuck in. So this is me racing at the Sprint Series at Highlands Motorsport Park and that is me crashing the Racecraft Toyota 86 at Highlands Motorsport Park. Note the beautiful weather conditions, although that was nothing to do with the failure. This little bridge here, and I'm going to go back and uh, zoom in on a few uh, key points in a second. That little bridge there has claimed uh, more than its share of victims over the years, but uh, I didn't think that I was going to be one of them, and uh, unfortunately, yeah, that's exactly what happened. So I'll just explain what went wrong, and then we'll go back, and I just want to talk about a few of the key points from that video. Uh, so Highland Sprint Series round four, uh, haven't had much luck in the Sprint Series to date. The last time I raced at the Sprint Series I did a practice session, a qualifying session, qualified P1 in my class and then found out that uh, our suspension arms in the front of the car had two severely bent rod ends which uh, I wasn't really too keen on persevering with so I put the car on the trailer and headed home. Uh, this time though went even worse. It started out much the same. We had a combined practice and qualifying session and the way this race works is that uh, the cars are all split up into two groups and within those groups there are two classes each so ultimately four classes. I try where I can to run in class two and we run on a track where there is a breakout of one minute 20 so basically if you're quicker than one minute 20 uh, you go into the fastest class. A little bit of an unfair fight in that class because I'd be up against a couple of McLaren 570S GT4 race cars and our little Toyota 86 is reasonably quick but it's not McLaren GT4 quick. So fortunately I was right on the breakout there, I qualified P1 with a minute 21 uh, lap time. It was a half an hour long session. The track, as you may have seen there, is a lot of fro fog around. We're in the middle of winter here in Queenstown. Uh, track conditions were pretty treacherous. We, I think we didn't get above uh, 2 degrees C for the whole day. So it was incredibly difficult, particularly for the first 3 or 4 laps, to get any heat into the slicks at all. I was taking it pretty easy. We'd been practicing at the track the day before as well. So I kind of knew what I was in for there. Uh, despite that, and the fact that I'd only probably done maybe 5 or 6 reasonably spirited laps, managed to get that 121, so I knew I was probably there or thereabouts at the uh, top of the class, was happy with that, uh, but I actually ended up losing the brakes which wasn't overly inspiring. Uh, still really haven't actually got to the bottom of why that was the case, it was a factor of uh, boiling the brake fluid which really we shouldn't have been doing given the fact that we've got ample sized brakes on this car, the front brakes in particular use a six pot caliper and a, a, a massive rotor that only just fits underneath a 18 inch wheel. We've also got brake cooling ducts on the car which we've never had before and we run a good quality brake fluid that's got a, a very high boiling point. So I haven't quite got to the bottom of that, that fluid also for those who are wondering was relatively fresh so anyway that's what happened so I lost the brakes and basically decided I was not going to be pushing on too much harder uh, with no brakes came in got the brakes bled up and as I say ended up uh, at the top of my class so it's a pretty good place to start. So it is a sprint race six lap races with a rolling start I was uh, on P6 of the grid given that there was still that class in front of me I got a pretty good start was again trying not to be a hero on that first lap because there had been a another qualifying practice session uh, between my practice session and the race, obviously lost all of the heat out of the tyres, so uh, particularly on the out lap, one of the McLarens spun on the first corner coming out of the pits, just showing again how hard it is or how easy it is to uh, come unstuck on a cold slick on a cold track. 
uh, I ended up lining up with a McLaren in front of me and with a Hyundai TCR to the side of me. So again, pretty unfair fight. Wasn't really going to claim any uh, any victims on those two cars. So it was all about just getting through the first few corners unscathed. Did exactly that. About a lap and a half in, started to get some heat into the tyres and get into a bit of a, a rhythm. The McLaren and the TCRs had sort of gapped me a little bit and I had a Janetta that was behind me. Uh, that was actually one of the cars from the faster pack. So uh, theoretically, he was going to probably pass me. Everything went really well for the first three laps. On my fourth lap was where things came unstuck. And coming up to the bridge, so let's just head back to uh, the in car here. I'll just try and get the right spot here so we can see what's happening. Uh, so coming up to the bridge, so we've got the entrance to the bridge here which sort of goes through a left right chicane. Uh, braking marker is somewhere around about here and at this point I'm doing probably about maybe 180 odd kilometres an hour, maybe 170 kilometres an hour in fifth gear. Uh, so the aim here is to brake and then shift down into fourth gear which would be easy you'd think, right? Pretty simple manoeuvre fifth down to fourth. Didn't manage to do that though, instead I managed to slot it into sixth gear which is uh, what happens around about here. Uh, got it into sixth and straight away noticed that as I'm running across this right hand curbing. Now no real harm done going from fifth down into sixth, obviously the car's got no power. Uh, I'm sort of watching out of my mirror up here though and seeing this Janetta uh, gaining on me and obviously didn't want to give away the advantage I had so of course it did what anyone would do, had another crack at fourth gear. This time things went from bad to worse though instead of fourth gear, this time I got second which has the effect of instantly compression compression locking the rear wheels, it's basically the same as pulling the handbrake on and if we play from here you'll see exactly what happens. So as soon as I do that you can see it spins the rear around, I'm sort of going a little bit right hand down as I'm coming across that kerb and normally sort of come up onto the bridge. Uh, so of course because of that lateral force there it just spins the back around. Uh, at this point I'm kind of just about a passenger and you can see hits the uh, bridge really really hard there with the front left hand corner, front right hand corner of the car. And uh, from there I'm sort of left thinking what could have been, we'll just show another angle from that again, actually I want to go back to this first one, nope this is the one I want. Uh, so things could have been a lot worse though uh, and we'll see that I actually did get off relatively lightly albeit with a fairly hefty bill that we're going to be paying for repairing the damage. Uh, you can also see that Janetta behind me, I wasn't just making things up, see he's pretty damn close, didn't really want him to get past me although uh, pulling second gear and spinning into the bridge wasn't the way to achieve that as it turns out. So anyway as we go through this performance here and you'll see the car spins, I want you to just notice here uh, that was hitting the front corner of the car but also just how close I actually end up getting here to taking out the rear of the car as well. Ooh, so close that when I actually got out of the car back in the pits the first thing I did was walk around the back of the car because I was pretty confident I'd tap the rear as well. So uh, small win there it was only the front end of the car that was damaged. Now another thing I just want to basically while I'm pointing out my complete stupidity here let others learn from my mistakes. Number one don't change into the wrong gear it's going to get expensive regardless. The other one though and this is probably a little bit more serious to be honest uh, and, and really does need to be discussed here. What we can see here is uh, my left hand shoulder belt and it's not properly located. So what I am wearing here which uh, is, is a legal requirement now in a lot of motorsport here in New Zealand is a Hans device, so a head and neck restraint and uh, these are pretty well proven, they've been around for, for probably more than a decade I guess now, uh, these have been pretty well proven to severely reduce the likelihood of damage to the driver's neck in the event of a heavy front on impact which is kind of what I had. Fortunately for me it was kind of a bit of a glancing blow, we didn't go straight into the wall and it was more a glancing blow down the wall but that doesn't change the effect, the, the point here that uh, for that Hans device to be properly effective uh, it's essential that the belt is properly located and you can see that's not uh, the case here. Uh, what's a little bit harder to see is uh, I kind of got a get out of jail free card here because right up the top the belt actually is located on the Hans device but uh, it should also be located down this section here. Now the reason for this and the takeaway here is that uh, they actually cancelled a, uh, a rides session that was supposed to be between the qualifying session for the other group and my race so we kind of got a relatively small amount of time to go and suit up and get ourselves ready and 
and uh, hurrying and race cars except out on the track don't really go together too well uh, so normally we'd have someone actually check the driver's belts because of course when you are strapped in it's impossible for you to actually see so you're kind of doing it by feel and I kind of had the the, the feeling that something wasn't quite right there uh, but of course with a, a time crunch on my hands it didn't really make the issue out of it that I should have so uh, just a point to take away there really important if you want your safety gear to work as it should uh, make sure that it's installed correctly should go without saying but there you go I'm saying it anyway. So yeah, not not really a, a good start to my day. Four laps in and it was game over. The car was actually still drivable and I did limp it back down to the pits. Uh, key was that I was basically in a blind section of the bridge. I knew that I had the field of cars coming up behind me and I wanted to get the hell out of their way before I ended up getting T-boned or run up to the, the rear end of uh, while they couldn't see me. So that was the first thing. Uh, one of the things you obviously want to consider here is, is it sta safe to continue? driving I was completely off the racing line and for the most part actually driving on grass so wasn't too concerned about oiling down the track but the other issue is anytime you've had a frontal impact like that obviously if you've got oil coolers and radiators up there uh, you need to be aware that those are quite likely to have been punctured that actually turned out to be the case our oil cooler was toast and as I cycled into the pits uh, the oil pressure warning light came on but that was something I was looking for only at idle speed so not really too concerned so I don't know what you can really take away from this uh, I put it down to complete driver stupidity on my part I'm not trying to make excuses here uh, and it's not a problem that I've had in this car in the past we've been racing this car since we had it brand new back in 2012 so definitely got a lot of experience with it and haven't had too many issues with the six-speed box I don't know last season I spent the majority of my time racing our black 86 with a sequential uh, maybe that's something to do with it maybe I need sequentials in every car I drive or paddle shift even better but but uh, either way, definitely an expensive uh, learning curve and something I don't want to repeat in a hurry. So we'll have a quick look at the, the carnage that ensued. So here's the front of the car as we got it back to the pits. Uh, another angle of basically the same. So you can see that it was the right-hand side corner that went in hardest. Um, interestingly, I did look at our G-Force data and the logging to kind of see how big that impact was. It wasn't really anything to take into to account there. It wasn't that massive actually. It's only registering about 1.5 or 1.8 G. Uh, it was a combined lateral and longitudinal hit though and I think after in hindsight because uh, my neck the next day was saying it was more than a 1.5 G hit. We pulled that laterally in a corner. Uh, so I think the the problem with this was that I'm data logging lateral and longitudinal G force at 20 hertz. Uh, so there's a better than average chance that the actual peak G force sample ended up uh, with in between two samples so I didn't really get uh, the true size of that hit. Uh, however, while oh, also our, our brand new GoPro Hero 8, literally the first time it had been used, uh, we thought that it would be a great place to get get footage from the front lip of the bumper. Uh, yeah, not so good. And sadly as well, while the GoPro was destroyed, uh, we were hopeful that the SD card might be intact. No such luck. The SD card's fried so we don't even get that angle of it. But it is always nice when we've got the video crew coming to the track because any stupidity on the driver's part is caught from multiple angles. There's also a uh, long lens from up on the uh, control tower as well capturing the fun. Uh, we're only one, one shot away from having a drone in the air for this as well. So when while it does look all pretty grim at the moment from those photos, we actually got it back to the workshop and it's actually probably not the best photo. Stripped away all of the damage and... Uh, we actually got off incredibly lightly. Uh, the damage is almost solely constrained to bolt-off components, so that is one thing. Uh, lucky, I mean those bolt-off components are still pretty pricey, so it's not ideal. And just to show you sort of how dramatic that hit was and how some of the safety equipment on these cars works, this is the front crash bar. Now, hopefully you're going to be able to see this. Uh, this bolts to the front chassis rails, and uh, uh, obviously this part here is or should be the same length on the left hand side and the right hand side of the car so you can see how this part of the car is designed to crush and crumple and uh, absorb that energy rather than transferring it back into the passenger's compartment uh, I'll try and chuck this underneath the overhead camera so you can see uh, exactly how crumpled that has become so it's done its job and as an upshot while it's obviously there predominantly to protect the driver I'm pretty safe because of the other safety 
equipment we've got in the car. Uh, this also had, had the advantage of uh, not transferring all of that crash energy uh, directly into the chassis rail, uh, which is why the chassis rail at, a, at least visually looks like it's still intact. Uh, while everything does look straight, we are still going to get the car onto a chassis machine and have it measured and just make sure it doesn't take a lot to tweak the chassis in a way that isn't visible and of course uh, then with a the race car you're going to be constantly fighting handling problems uh, in the future because you've got a chassis that is a little bit bent. So there you go, uh, my stupidity in a nutshell don't do that. Now if you are wondering about the irony that is Racecraft, our sister company, and the fact that Racecraft teaches people how to drive race cars, so far we don't have a module on how to change gears in an H pattern but maybe we need that, you'll be happy to know that I was never intending to be the front man for that course. We're going to have a pro driver doing that, a pro driver who knows where fourth gear is in an H pattern gearbox, so don't worry. Alright, moving on, we have also been working pretty hard uh, recently on our second facility. So I don't actually know if I've talked much about this. Uh, we've got to a point now where we've kind of outgrown the current HPA labs and particularly with uh, the intention to get more talent to go in front of a camera. Uh, the problem with HPA labs is that it's very difficult to film more than one thing at a time and particularly while I'm in, in here in the studio filming, uh, Brandon out in the workshop beside me can't really do anything that's going to create any noise so it's really hampered our product activity. So uh, we took over the keys to a second facility which is about 500 metres around the corner from us uh, just before the COVID-19 lockdown which wasn't exactly ideal timing. This is uh, essentially about a 70 or 80 square metres square metre workshop uh, with some offices above and we've just been going through the process of getting that sorted out. So uh, we'll have a quick look at my laptop screen again for a second and obviously there's not really that much to see right now. It's a big concrete shed big deal but I just want to go through some of the stuff that we have got planned for this. So basically we're looking into the workshop area through a roller door at the moment and uh, it's basically got a toilet block over here as well as a little kitchenette that you can't see behind these boxes. And uh, what we want to do is set this up as a multi-purpose studio so that we can film a variety of different aspects be it for racecraft or for high performance academy. Uh, this is kind of the look and feel that we were going for albeit probably minus the the uh, Porsche. Uh, so we want to equip it with something the likes of the uh, cabinetry that you can see behind this. I think this is actually from Obsessive Garage. We got some ideas from uh, from them and as well as the Sonic uh, equipment uh, cabinetry there and also the Swiss track tiles which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. So that's kind of what we're going for. Uh, found it really difficult uh, and incredibly expensive to get the Sonic cabinetry here in New Zealand. So we've actually gone with another brand, Craftworks, and uh, they've got quite a nice online configurer program so you can sort of set it all up. So this is basically what we're going to have and that's going to be uh, located essentially something like uh, this. It's probably not going to be red though but it's going to go down those two walls anyway. So it will give us something that we can shoot over into the corner uh, once we've got all that stuff. That's on order but it's uh, around about three months wait out of Europe so it's going to be a little while. In the meantime though uh, we have been going through some setups on where all of our lighting's going to go and uh, we're trying not to guess here. We really want to get the best best result possible uh, in the quickest amount of time. Uh, so using a piece of software called Blender, Sam, one of our video crew, went through and actually did a lighting layout. So you can do a render exactly like this. Uh, you'll note that the front end of the Racecraft 86 in this picture, much straighter than it is now, but that's a separate matter. But what we can basically see is what the lighting is going to do in terms of reflections off the windscreen and other components. So we can lay out the lighting panels where we want them to get the best possible result. Uh, so at the moment we've got the ceiling, this is a suspended ceiling which will include our lighting panels that's going in. Uh, hopefully that will be finished by the end of this week and the other aspect we have been looking at is the tiling for the floor. Uh, so this is just our 350Z looking at a variety of the different options that we have available and choosing flooring for a workshop can be a little bit tricky. Uh, this is something we've gone through a few times in the past both with our workshop out here at HPA Labs as well as my, with my 
my own workshop uh, back at my old business. And uh, the usual sort of angle is to go with a two pot epoxy paint on the floor. That looks great, particularly when it is brand new, but we've actually found that it wears quite quickly. Uh, particularly sticky slicks will mark it or actually even sometimes pull the epoxy off the surface. And it does require quite a lot of maintenance to keep it in good condition and looking good, particularly for the work we're doing videoing it. So we've gone with the Swiss track tile system, which uh, was what you saw in the obsessive garage picture, very similar. Uh, and that's uh, exactly what I've got here in front of me. So uh, just a plastic tile, it's uh, around about 15 mil in height, and these just click together. So you can basically build them out to whatever specification you want in terms of size. Uh, you can get them in a million different colors. Everyone seems to go with the old traditional black and white checkered theme. We're trying to stay away from that try and keep it a little bit more classy so we're probably just going to have a dark charcoal finish throughout the whole place. A nice thing with this is that because it is a sort of uh, a a drain tray I guess if you like. If you do get a, a spill on it, it's going to end up going through the tile. You can flush that away with something like brake clean. Now obviously that doesn't fix the problem and at some point you're probably going to want to remove these. We're thinking probably 6 or 12 monthly. Uh, we'll pull them all out and properly pressure wash the floor down but for our purposes what it does is it gives a quick clean finish uh, every time we are filming in there. Uh, these also are easy to remove because for some of our course materials the likes of corner weighting, uh, we don't want to be putting the corner weight scales down on something like this. We do want them on a completely solid surface on the concrete slab underneath. So uh, these are actually pretty easy to unclip in sections as required to do tasks like that. So uh, hopefully the Swiss track tiles should be here tomorrow. As I said, uh, ceiling should be done by the end of the week. So we're really just waiting on that cabinetry, which unfortunately, as I mentioned, is a little ways off. So I'm uh, really excited to get uh, the uh, Racecraft lab up and running and we'll be seeing some more footage and filming from that facility as time goes by. Uh, right, I just also wanted to mention if you uh, aren't uh, up to speed on it. We are currently releasing weekly vlogs. We'll head across to my laptop screen. Uh, the one that we released on Friday was an introduction to our Toyota FJ40 build. So a uh, bit of background on that that car. That's actually my daily driver uh, and we're planning on doing a fairly thorough resto mod on it. So basically uh, keeping the authentic look of the classic FJ40 Cruiser uh, but modernising both the engine and the drivetrain. So if you want to check that out, go and have a watch. If you've got any questions on anything in there, please ask those in the comments. And if you aren't already subscribed to our YouTube channel, make sure you do so. This will make sure you don't miss out on any future updates. And uh, our, our release at the end of this week will be covering uh, aspects on wheel alignment and corner weighting. And you'll also get a bit of a behind the scenes look at how we actually film uh, some of our course material when we head to Highlands Motorsport Park and actually do some track testing with our Toyota 86, only this time I don't crash it which is ideal. So go check that out. Uh, also uh, something that we don't talk about too much but uh, probably should is the articles section on our website. So if we head across to the articles page you can find that here at the top and uh, one of the ones that we recently released is don't waste time dyno tuning and this article just gives you some insight basically from my 20 odd years in the industry now about what you should be looking at, what you should be keeping in mind before you take your car to the dyno. This doesn't matter if you are an enthusiast getting your car tuned or if you are actually a professional tuner with a dyno. There's some tips and tricks in there to help minimise uh, wasted time for both parties as well as a checklist that you can go through uh, with your car as well because let's face it, no one likes turning up to the dyno and finding that you've got to take your car off the dyno part way through because there's a problem that you could have easily uh, foreseen and had repaired. So check out that. There's also a bunch of other interesting articles on there. Lastly for today we have just launched another one of our giveaways and this time we are partnering with our sister company Ernest which is Ernest Clothing. I'm wearing one of the Ernest Fabrication uh, aprons right now. So this deal will give you basically the full suite of Ernest Clothing. You're going to get one of the Fabrication aprons, you're going to get one of our K Canvas jackets. Uh, K Canvas is a special material that includes a uh, 
a, a Kevlar weave in it for extra strength. Uh, you're also going to get a set of Tasker K canvas pants. I'm wearing them, can't really get them into shop, but basically they look like pants only better. And you're also going to get a pair of Ernest Harden overalls for working uh, out in the workshop, or for that matter, you can sit on the couch watching TV wearing them. We're not going to judge either way. Uh, so you're going to get all of that. You're also going to get an HPA T. You're going to get a uh, Ernest T, and you're going to get our VIP deal, which is access to every course we currently offer, as well as every course that we will be releasing in the future. Uh, so that package deal off the top of my head, I think is a valued at over two and a half thousand US dollars. I'll get Luke to drop a link into the comments that you can follow if you want to get your name into the drawer. Uh, there's still a fair bit of time left for that deal to run. There's a few other tasks that you can complete as well to give you a few more entries into the drawer, drawer and increase your odds of winning. Winning. and doesn't matter whereabouts in the world you are, we will ship to your door, so don't think you're going to miss out. Alright, thanks for watching our pre-show there, just give me a few moments and we'll get started with our lesson. If you liked that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up, and if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.